great to be with you at St. Mel's. I see a lot of familiar faces, some not so familiar. We're going to try to do uh, something almost impossible, but we'll do it anyway. We're going to uh, try to synthesize the church's teaching. Uh, I came up with this title because I thought it would catch a lot of attention. How Catholics Read the Bible. There's a method, you know. <laughs> there is. It, no, most people don't know that. The vast majority of Catholics, even, have no idea whatsoever that there is a specific method to reading sacred scripture. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were created through him, and without him nothing that was created was created. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Indeed, the darkness could not, cannot, and will not overcome the light who is Christ himself. This first lecture or conference is on divine revelation itself. Now let me just lay out the format for you. What I'm doing in this little mini-series, How Catholics Read the Bible, uh, I'm giving you the Church's foundational contemporary document on this subject. This is one of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council, Dei Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's from the first letter of John. All of this is about union with God. It's a very essential thing to remember what all of this is about. We are not engaging in a merely academic exercise. Some of you might remember when I taught the course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, one of the things that I tried to emphasize, and I'm going to emphasize it once again because it needs emphasis, is that we are not dealing with a something. When we deal with the Word of God, we aren't dealing merely with something. We are dealing with somebody. The Word of God, Jesus. Jesus is the Father's only Word. There's a lot of interest nowadays in reading the Bible, and rightly there should be. After all, it is the Word of God. It has the power to build us up. It has the power to, well, make us who we are, the body of Christ. We have today a crisis. It can be called a crisis of method. The reason that I'm doing this uh, little course, this mini-series, is because there's such a great need for it, and I honestly don't know of anyone else who's done it. You know, I looked around, and I couldn't find any competition. <laughs> None. I, I, I don't, I'm not aware, now I could be, you know, I'm not aware of everything that goes on, but I'm not aware of any widely distributed uh, series, uh, even a little one like this, that I'm going to do on this subject matter, and it is of enormous importance. It's about principles. You know, the old uh, adage really um, is relevant here. Remember that old saying, uh, 
You give a man a fish, you can feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. Now that's what this is about. We'll teach you how to fish. You know, I'm an old fisherman. We we'll teach you how to fish. And I'll tell you, your catch is going to be great. It's going to be so great. The Word of God. You've got to be in love with the Word of God. The Word of God isn't just some kind of a dry thing you find in a book. We've got a crisis today, a real crisis. It's a crisis of method. Uh, there's a methodology that is involved in doing theology the way the Catholic Church does. There's a method, a methodology, proper method, involved in how Catholics read the Bible. In almost any sphere of influence, there is a method. If you want the desired result, there's a method that you go about in order to attain it. If you do it wrong, you're not going to get the desired result. Uh, a lot of people forget, especially in this day and age of great advances in technology, everything seems to change. Uh, we forget that when we uh, are involved with Catholic theology, with Catholic scripture study, we have to remember this is something we've received. This is not something we make up as we go along. Jesus Christ also never intended that eternal truth be determined by a democratic vote. <laughs> Doesn't make a bit of difference. It is what it is, whether a million people like it or not, believe it or not, it's the same. Very often I run into people, even Catholics, who will say, oh, I don't believe that cavalierly dismissing some essential element of Catholic teaching, imagining that somehow the essential teaching can change throughout the ages. It can. What we're dealing with when we deal with divine revelation, when we deal with the Bible, when we deal with the truth, we are dealing with something which is essentially immutable. You know what that term immutable means, unchangeable. Why is the truth, the word of God in its essence, why is that immutable, unchangeable? Because the truth in its substance is God himself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Right? A divine person is speaking. I am the way, the truth, and the life. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us all truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth? God. You know why God is unchangeable? Because he's perfect. God admits of no change because he is absolute perfection. God's not on the way. God is eternally arrived. We're on the way, right? We're creatures. We're imperfect. We change. God doesn't change. That's a fact. That's an absolute doctrinal fact. St. Peter reminds us of something very important in his second letter. First of all, you must understand this. Always pay attention to words. When, when St. Peter says, first of all, that means it's of primary importance. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture no assertion found in sacred scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Listen to the word of God. That's not a matter of your personal interpretation or mine. Nothing in the Bible, no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. But men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Very often... I'll run into people, and they'll read the Bible and thank God for that. And they'll 
say, oh, well, I, it means that, I'll give you an example. I was down in Florida when I began preaching many years ago, and there was a particular minister down there who was using the Bible to justify murdering abortion doctors. Believe it or not, somebody had the audacity to be publicly preaching that homicide, even, was justifiable. He was using the Bible to, to do it. Hey, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Right now, abortion's a horrible thing. Don't get me wrong. It's a terrible thing. But there is no way on earth that anybody in their right mind can take the scriptures and use that as a basis for knocking off anybody. We just can't do that. Guess what happened? Two doctors were murdered in Pensacola within two years. There's a method. And you've got to know the method. No mere personal interpretations. The scriptures have as their primary author God. Make no mistake about that. God is the author of the Bible. The primary author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit. And unless a person guided by the church is filled with that same Holy Spirit, they will never be able to interpret the word of God. They will remain, I don't care how many university degrees they have, they will remain an outsider and an amateur unless imbued with that same spirit who wrote the sacred scriptures to begin with. Father John Hardin, a great Jesuit scholar of our times who was such a good teacher, for so many people he passed on last year, defined methodology in his uh, modern dictionary of the Catholic faith. He said, methodology or method is either a system of principles and procedures applied to a given study or discipline or the underlying principles that govern a certain activity. Uh, methodology is an essential part of the Christian religion. This is common sense, really. Can you imagine, imagine an engineer, okay, a bridge engineer, who didn't follow the principles, the accepted principles of engineering, physics, mathematics. I'm not driving across his bridge. <laughs> no how. Uh, can you imagine... Uh, an attorney, for instance, who didn't ex accept the principles of law. You know, he said, I'm going to make up my own. And he gets in that courtroom and he's representing you. Guess what the judge is going to do to him and you? He's going to throw you right out. A CPA who doesn't follow generally accepted accounting principles, you know, and goes into his client's office one day and says, Mr. Jones, uh, would you like our accounting principles to show a profit or a loss today? <laughs> right? There's a method in everything. You don't get the method right, the desired outcome is not going to be forthcoming. Right at the outset, let me emphasize something. What we're approaching here in this mini-series, How Catholics Read the Bible. Now look, let, let me make a footnote. Sidebar. This stuff isn't rocket science. Okay? Y'all can get this. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. This is not rocket science. Do not be intimidated by studying your faith. It belongs to you. It's your legacy. It's your inheritance. And it is not so, you know, the wonderful thing about God, our Father, is that he makes these things accessible to us. You know, remember when Jesus rejoiced in, in spirit? He said, oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the learned and the clever, but have revealed them to the merest children. He rejoiced in spirit. That's the truth, the word of God. You can understand this, and you need to understand this. You're going to learn these principles, and you won't have any trouble with it. 
I promise you that. Now, we're dealing here with divine revelation. We're dealing with the Word of God. I thank God for a little gift I have. Now, I have five university degrees, a doctorate in theology, but I have never acquired that uncanny knack that certain scholars seem to have of confusing and complicating people. <laughs> Boy, I thank God for that. That's a great gift. Remember the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen? Remember some of us, we used to watch him on television when I was a kid. Sunday night, we'd watch Bishop Sheen. Life is worth living. You know, he's a, probably the greatest preacher of the 20th century, at least in the English language. When Bishop Sheen was a young priest, having just finished his doctorate, he was a very, very highly educated man, an erudite man, a saintly man. He was teaching a class in London, I believe. It was a class of deacons. And he was holding forth on theandric actions. Now, that's a, a fancy word. It comes from Greek words. Theandric actions, that just means the actions of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And he was holding forth in, you know, words this long as only he could do. He had a way with words. And when he was finished with it, one of the deacons he was teaching came up to him. And he said, oh, Dr. Sheen, positively brilliant, positively brilliant. Bishop Sheen said, oh, yeah, what did I say? And he said, well, I don't quite know. <laughs> Bishop Sheen said, neither do I. And he vowed he would never do that. Very often, teachers think that their business is to sound so educated that their students have to kind of blink their eyes and say, what did he say? That's not intelligent, that's not education, and that's not being a good teacher. Your students, first and foremost, should be able to understand what the heck you're talking about. It's that easy. We're talking here with Catholics. Now, there's a, a very great difference between the way Catholics read the Bible and the way any of the other Christian churches do. Now, I love all of our Christian brothers and sisters, and I mean that. I have a lot of good friends who are Baptist pastors, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, and I think very highly of them, very highly of them. Number one, because they're wonderful people, but number two, they have a great reverence for the Word of God, and, and that makes them special in my book, and they are Christians. I'll often say to one of my Southern Baptist friends, I oh, Pastor, good to see you this morning. You know, I am just so happy you're a member of my church. <laughs> and he'll say, what the heck are you talking about? I ain't no Catholic. <laughs> well, only one church, only one head of the church, Jesus. He only has one church. You're baptized, aren't you? Baptism is what brings us into the church. And they are, almost all of them, they all have valid baptism. The way we approach divine revelation God, our Father, reveals himself to us in the person of his only Son. Okay? That, so that word, divine revelation, like don't, don't blink your eyes and say, huh, what's that? Divine revelation. Divine revelation. God, our Father, revealing himself to us in the person of his only Son. Let me read something to you. It's so beautiful. It's from one of the great saints, one of the great doctors of the Catholic Church, St. John of the Cross. There are 33 doctors of the Church, only 33, right? In over 2,000 years, there's only 33, thousands of saints, only 33 doctors of the Church. St. John of the Cross, great Carmelite, is one of them. Here's what he has to say. It's very, very illuminating. Listen to him. In giving us his son... His only word, for he possesses no other, he spoke everything to us at once in this sole word. And he has no more to say, because what he spoke before to the prophets in parts, he has now spoken all at once by giving us the all who is his son. Any person questioning God or desiring some vision or revelation 
would be guilty not only of foolish behavior, but also of offending him by not fixing his eyes entirely upon Christ and by living with the desire for some other novelty. God, our Father, spoke but one word in the eternal silences of the Trinity, his only word, Jesus the Lord. Foundational, fundamental, essential, the word of God is the second person of the blessed Trinity, the Father's only Son. Now this is very important. This is going to go right over most people's heads. They're not going to say, you know, it's so simple. But don't let this go over your head. It is hard to fall in love with a dead letter. It is hard to fall in love with a few words in a book, no matter how beautiful those words are. But the word of God of which I speak, the authentic word of God, isn't a something. Somebody, a divine somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. Please, if you remember nothing else, remember that. And when you read the Bible, what you're doing is you're learning about Jesus. St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, said, Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. And that means the entire scripture. But what about the Old Testament? You mean that speaks of Christ? Absolutely it does. The entire Bible is all about the Word of God. Jesus, the eternal Word of our Heavenly Father. All right. We know that truth has two dimensions to it. An objective and a subjective dimension. Now listen, this is important. Very, very important. It's philosophy, but don't let that scare you. We're all philosophers. You know that? That even if you don't have any formal education, you're a philosopher. Everybody goes by a certain philosophy. And so here's a little bit of philosophy. Two dimensions in truth. The objective dimension and the subjective dimension. What's the object? This is really simple. This is so simple that it reminds me of a joke. <laughs> I tell the same jokes over and over and over. I've been telling the same jokes for 10 years. Somebody said to me, why don't you get some new jokes? <laughs> hmm. Kurt Schirmer's been traveling with me for years now, <clears throat> and I, I could actually fit him into this joke. But Bishop Sheen told this joke. He said there was a uh, professor of physics who used to travel around giving lectures all over the country with a chauffeur, a limousine, and the chauffeur said to him, you know, I have listened to you give that lecture day after day and year after year. Uh, you know what, I could give that thing as good as you do. <laughs> so the professor said, okay, tonight you put on my, my suit and I'll put your chauffeur uniform on. You give the lecture, I'll sit in the audience. And so the, the chauffeur went up there and he gave a perfect lecture. Absolutely perfect. Somebody raised their hand, though, and said, well, Professor, that was beautiful, but could you just explain to me how it is that E equals mc squared results in this nuclear fission, whereby this, that, and he looked at them and he said, what? That's the most elementary, silly, stupid question I've ever heard in my life, and just to prove it, I'm going to let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> So this is really simple. <laughs> Truth, reality, subjective dimension, objective dimension. The objective dimension is the thing in itself. <clears throat> usually, usually I have a Bible. Imagine that I'm teaching a course on how Catholics read the Bible, and I don't have a Bible with me tonight. I will, I'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> Imagine this was. This, this happens to be the lectionary, which is filled with readings from from the Bible. Now, I can hold this up, and this, whether you believe it or not, like it or not, think so or not, this is a lectionary for Sunday Mass. Now, somebody in the back may say, oh, no, it's not. That is for sure a pepperoni pizza. 
and they may be absolutely sincere in their belief. But just remember, you can be just as sincerely wrong as you are sincerely right. And so it doesn't matter how sincere you are, this in itself is what it is, whether you like it or not or believe it or not. That's the objective dimension of truth. Now, what's the subjective? That's the, the mind perceiving, the individual, the subjective action. All right, my mind. In my mind, I take a look at this, and if my mind, the subject perceiving this thing, comes into conformity with it and says, aha, lectionary, what it results? Intellectual truth results. This is called ontological truth. You don't have to remember that word. This means the thing in itself, okay? That's the objective dimension. Now, this is going to become important later. All right. In God. Now, God himself is the author of all that is. God himself is the truth. God is reality. Now, this is very important. Do you know that a good working definition of insanity is to be out of touch with reality? I will hold that an awful lot of people today are out of touch with God. You might agree with that, right? Looking around, watching the news, or your own experience. A lot of people are out of touch with God. God they're out of touch with reality. Absolutely and objectively speaking, God is the perfectly real. And when you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. You are insane. And we wonder why we have so many insane things in the world. That's why. That's why. God is the truth, objectively speaking. That's where the subject of action and the object are complete conformity. Now, all truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth. The word of God is truth. Jesus said and says to us now, I am the way, the truth. I am the truth. Jesus, the word of God, is the truth. He is the light which shines in the darkness. Now the darkness is trying to overcome that light right now. Perhaps more than any other time in history, there is a battle going on between the forces of Light and the forces of darkness, the forces of truth and the forces of lies, the forces of life and the forces of death, good and evil, are locked in an immortal combat. The souls of God's little children are the spoils of this victory and this war. Last weekend, I also did a, a new series, a mini-series in Michigan, called Immortal Combat. Um, it, it was a more in-depth treatment of spiritual warfare. I've done that before in uh, not a, maybe I think three talks I did on it one time. We did that. Uh, people are interested in this stuff. We had a big circus tent on 40 acres. They thought we, this was for leaders, lay leaders. They had so many other people want to come. It was supposed to be 200 people. Then it grew to 500,000, 1,500. They, they came from everywhere. I forget about 29 states, I think, they told me. People are interested in this. This is a matter of life or death. Do you really know how to read the Bible? You need to. You need to. You know, when I taught the course on the catechism, I was very edified. We had 2,000-plus people coming to the Sacramento Convention Center one Saturday a month for a whole year, back in 1996. Uh, as a result of it, we had Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, uh, Mormons, Protestants of every description come into the Catholic Church, enter the Catholic Church as the result of this. I'll never forget a story told me about a Jewish man who had come to listen to the lectures on the catechism. He liked what he heard. And he entered an RCIA program in one of the parishes. And as part of the RCIA um, preparation, uh, I'm, I'm sure it had good points to it. Uh, but I can <laughs> tell you one that wasn't so good. Uh, 
they would sit around and um, they'd take a passage of the Bible. Now, this is very common. It's done even in the Catholic Church, and it's silly. They'd take a passage, somebody read it, then they'd go around the room, and everybody would say what they thought it meant. Well, they came around the room, and they came to the Jew, and they said, and Saul, what do you think it means? He said, what the heck do you mean? What do I think it means? I came here to find out what you people think it means. <laughs> That's not how you read the Bible as a Catholic. Now, by all means, read it somehow to start with. I'm just glad you pick it up. I'm thankful for that. But there's a method. God knows all things perfectly in knowing himself. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us. In this we have absolute conformity of knower and object known. In fact, this conformity is identity. Truth is not only thus in the divine mind. God not only has truth, God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. Now, God, our Father, so loved the world that he sent his only Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but come to everlasting life. Hence, this word, this truth, which is taught in sacred scripture, is not something extrinsic to Christ. It is Christ. Let me give you an example. When, when I taught the catechism course, I, I think the first thing I told some of you, I recognize a lot of you, you were there. There's only one teacher. Remember, Jesus said that, you know. There's only one teacher, one rabbi. One teacher. To the degree that you become one with Jesus, the only teacher you'll be able to teach. To the degree that you become one with the truth, you'll be able to impart the truth. Now, I'm giving you the method here. I'm giving you an essential part of this method, how Catholics read the Bible. First and foremost, conformity. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son reveals the Heavenly Father. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 51, tells us that it pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. His will was that men should have access to the Father through Christ the Word made flesh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and thus become sharers in the divine nature. Let me tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the worst errors, one of the worst maladies that has fallen upon the house of God. That is taking the study of sacred scripture or theology and reducing it merely to an academic exercise. This is a disaster. The study of sacred scripture should bring you more into unity, into intimacy with Christ. And then Christ in the power of his spirit brings us to the Father. What is all this about? This is about salvation. That's what this is about. This is about the salvation of souls. The word of God has the power to transform us into who we are, the body of Christ. Anything less than that just ain't good enough. In plain English, this is about getting to heaven. Now here's where a lot of the scholars will scoff at my approach. They will. I know it. You know, my greatest gift is in preaching. My greatest gift is that I don't give a fat rat's you-know-what who likes it. <laughs> That's my greatest gift, in case you don't know. 
I don't care if they like it or not. At the end, when the smoke of battle is blown away and time gives way to eternity, at the end, you and I are going to stand before Almighty God and we're going to be one or two things, a winner or a loser, heaven or hell. That's in your face reality. Now the contemporary mind doesn't quite like that kind of a stark presentation. That's because the contemporary mind is weak in many respects. That is a fact, an absolutely irrefutable fact of theology and reality. Listen, at the end, now purgatory is just a brief stop on the way to heaven. Okay? That part of the doctrine of the faith, we believe in purgatory in the Catholic Church, and it's biblical. It's biblical. There are certainly passages in Scripture that relate to it. But purgatory notwithstanding, that's just a final purification. A lot of people say, well, God couldn't have no purgatory, a good God, a merciful God. I'll tell you what, purgatory is the mercy of God. <laughs> because if it wasn't for that, you'd have to be perfect. You know, a lot of us ain't getting in without purgatory. All right. God, who dwells in unapproachable light, wants to communicate his own divine life to the men he freely created. Imagine that. God, who dwells in unapproachable light wants to communicate his own divine life to us. He wants to make us his adopted children. Very often somebody will come up to me and say, oh, well, you know, Father, my husband's a good man. You know, he's, a, he's, he's very nice. He's considered. What's he really trying to tell me? He don't really go to church. <laughs> you know? Isn't that good enough? If, if, if we had a natural end, it'd be good enough. But I got news for you. We don't have a natural end. We have a supernatural end. And in order to attain a supernatural end, we need supernatural means. That's called sanctifying grace. And so being good old boy isn't good enough. All right. God wants to share his own life with us. I like simple, simple definitions, and it's good that you've got to memorize certain things. You have to know certain things. Sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. You don't have to worry about a more complicated definition than that. If anybody asks you, well, what, what's sanctifying grace? That's a share in divine life. God shares his divine life with us through sanctifying grace grace. That's what this is all about. God communicates himself to us in many ways, but one of the greatest ways is through his word. A mathematics teacher, an English teacher, a history teacher, what do they teach? They, they teach their subject matter, right? If you teach mathematics, you've got to learn mathematics first, right? And then you teach it. English, whatever, whatever it is, whatever your discipline is. The perfect teacher is Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the teacher. I'm the only teacher. All the rest of you are students. This is a case where the teacher and his subject matter are absolutely one. What did Jesus teach himself? Please, please try to grasp that. What did Jesus teach? He taught himself. What's the word of God? Jesus. What did he teach? He taught himself when we study the word of God. You know the word when we say I know, you know that word no, I know you, I know history, I know mathematics. The Semitic sense of that word is very, very enlightening. If you understand the Semitic uh, sense of the word no. In, in the Old Testament, for, for instance, it might say something like, uh, like with the... Um, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And Abraham knew his wife. It, it, it talked about intimacy, right? About marital intimacy. That's what we're talking about 
knowing the Word of God. It isn't a mere externalism. It isn't something you know from a distance. It's something that you not only know, but you love and union results. Union between you and the Word, such that the two become one. You recognize the words from marriage. The two become one flesh, says in the Bible. Husband and wife, when they're married, the two become one flesh. When you study the Word of God, when you read the Word of God, you become one with the Word of God. You've got to do it prayerfully. The two become one. That's what God wants. The whole point of this is becoming one with the one Word of God. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. And the Son is the Word of God. Dave Verbum, which is the document we're studying from Vatican II, there were 16 major documents in the Second Vatican Council. Um, this one is the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. What we're studying here is divine revelation. The Catholic approach is an approach to divine revelation in general. We study the Bible in the context of the broader scheme of divine revelation. Listen to Dave Verbum. Hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith this sacred synod asserts to the words of St. John, who says, We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim, proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Vatican II followed the Council of Trent and Vatican I in teaching on divine revelation. St. Thomas Aquinas said an error in the beginning is an error indeed. You do not want to make an error in principle at the beginning. If you do that, the, the error compounds itself and you get further and further astray from where you want to go. Do not try to read or interpret sacred scripture in a vacuum. Our approach Properly speaking, is an approach to divine revelation. We approach the word of God as, the, as it was given to us. Now, a, a common error is to take the position that the word of God is just the Bible. Okay? Now, that is the word of God. Make no mistake about it. The written word of God is definitely, absolutely... The Word of God, and that's what we're going to be primarily talking about. But I'm going, to, I'm going to try to express this to you in the form of an analogy, and it's awfully good analogy. Pay attention to it. Look. It is. It's a real good one. How many gods are there? One. All right. How many persons in God? Three. All right. Divine revelation. Is God's revelation, the one God, God's revelation to us, right? God wants to reveal himself to us. Why? He loves us. Remember when you were in love with your husband or your wife? Remember what that was like? You, you can remember back that far. <laughs> if you love somebody, you want to know all about that person, don't you? And, and you want to... Tell that person about you. There, a, a certain interchange takes place. Even if you don't do it consciously, it happens. There's an interchange. You want to share everything. God's that way. That's divine revelation. God so loves us. He wants to give himself to us. He, union with God, union with the most holy trinity, is the meaning of human life. Do you know why God created us? Yeah, and she, she knows. Yeah. A lot of us, especially us old people know. I'm from the old days. See, I grew up in the old days when we studied the Baltimore Catechism, and I'll tell you what, Sister Mildred drilled that thing into my head. <laughs> I wouldn't dare show up for school not having learned my catechism lesson. She said, why did God create you? God created me that I might know him and love him and serve him that I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. 
Do you see how old you are? <laughs> but you remember. We remember those things. And, and listen, that's an important thing to remember. I truly believe that you are among the most intelligent people in the world. At least you know why you're here. <laughs> most people don't. They're clueless. They're clueless. God created us for union with himself. And that's why he revealed himself to us in the person of his only son. All right. Three divine persons in that one God. Now, divine revelation. God, Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus assumes a human nature, becomes like one of us in everything except sin. All right. He walks in Palestine. He gathers his apostles and disciples around him. He teaches them. How does he teach them? Well, he teaches them by preaching. He's a preacher. He teaches them by example. They watched him. You know, they were around him for three years or so, and they watched him. The students watched their master, and, and they learned by watching him. It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself to us that way. What was the result of this revelation of our father to us in the person of his son? The result of it was the sanctification of those who came in contact with the Father's only word. The word, Jesus, has power. You know, this is about power. This is really about power. Power to save your soul. Power to save the souls of those you love. Now, only God can save a soul. I learned that much to my own chagrin shortly after I was ordained. I thought I was going to save the world. <laughs> I quickly found out I couldn't. But God can. God can, and he can do it through us. He chooses to do it through us. He doesn't need us. God could redeem an infinity of worlds just by snapping his divine fingers. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. God chose to assume a human nature. Jesus, the Father's only word, assumed a human nature, the incarnation. He became like one of us in everything except sin. And then he joined us to this great work of redemption. Now, God in the past revealed himself. How did he reveal himself in ancient times? Well, through creation, right? Uh, one of the most uh, ancient ways of God revealed himself, primitive revelation, it can be called, is through creation. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was younger, I used to be a fanatic outdoorsman, uh, fishing and hunting and camping. And I remember once being in the wilderness in Maine, way up in northern Maine, and I was on a hunting trip, and I was with a guide. And we were in a real backwoods area, about 30 miles from the nearest road. We were camping back there, and we came out just about dusk on a plateau overlooking a vast expanse of a hardwood swamp. And the way the sun hit it, it was in the fall, and it was just beautiful, brilliant with color. You know how it is uh, back east and this place in the Midwest, all the colors in the fall? Well, this was brilliant. The sun hit those red and absolutely magnificent yellow. And this friend of mine who was a rough guy, this guy, I mean, he was a backwoodsman, uh, and he wasn't particularly religious at all. That's an understatement. But the beauty and the silence of that moment just stopped us in our tracks. And, and he said, he didn't know what he was saying. He says, I'm a pantheist. Now, a pantheist is one who believes God is, is in everything in nature. Now, God is, but I'm not going to fall down out there and worship the oak tree. <laughs> That's the difference, okay? The, the pantheist thinks that God is, in fact, you know. My friend said that what he meant was, I've come in contact with God this beauty of nature. That's one of the ways God revealed himself to us primitively, through the beauty of nature, the, the order of nature. Okay? Also, God revealed himself to us through Abraham and the patriarchs and through Moses and the commandments and through the prophets. God revealed himself to, this, to us in that way. 
in ancient times, God revealed himself to us in various, various and many different ways. But then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. The incarnation. That's the fullness of revelation. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. All right. This revelation of our father in the person of his son was for a purpose. It was for the purpose of delivering us from the power of evil. Now, all of the biblical scholarship in the world, and it's a good thing, if it doesn't have as its ultimate end the salvation of souls is an exercise in futility. If we divorce scholarship from the work of redemption, that's silly and a waste of time. And why bother? And so we don't want to do that. Now, God has revealed himself to us. What's our business? Our business is to give the obedience of faith. Why do I believe what God has told me? Why do I believe in what God has revealed to me? Because it's plausible? No. Because it suits my fancy? No. Why? Because of the one who has revealed it. The one who is truth itself. The one who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Do you know what faith is? Now, some of you who were my students in the course on the catechism uh, could jump up right now and just rattle it off. Matter of fact, I know that all of you are most, or anyway, are very good Catholics, and you've studied your catechism. You all have a copy of it, certainly, and it's dog-eared, and the print is worn off. You've used it so much. And so if I ask you the very fundamental and essential question, what is the theological virtue of faith being such great Catholics and good scholars of your faith, why there wouldn't be more than two or three of you in here who couldn't answer it. For the sake of the two or three, <laughs> faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe all that God has said and revealed to us, believe all that Holy Church proposes for our beliefs, belief because of because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's faith. That's a very important thing. We're people of faith. This is a religion of faith. God revealed himself to us. We have to give the assent of faith. Now, God is the first principle and final end of all things. We can do nothing without God. Listen to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 105. Very important. This is fundamental. This is the beginning of our little mini-series here. God is the author of sacred scripture. Now that's a very fundamental thing, and I know most of you know that, but it needs to be said. God is the author of the Bible. Paragraph 106 of the Catechism. Now God inspired the human authors of the sacred books. To compose the sacred books, God chose certain men who all the while he employed them in this task, made full use of their own faculties and powers, so that though he acted in them and by them, it was as true authors that they consigned to writing whatever he wanted written and nothing more. So who is the author of the Bible? God. And the human authors too. Are they true authors? The human authors. Can they be considered true authors, though? Yes, they can. God chose to do it that way. God's the primary author of the Bible, but he worked through the instrumentality of human beings that he called and, and gave a special charism to. All right? they, they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that what they recorded, what they wrote down, was exactly what God wanted and nothing more and nothing less. So, God and man. We've got a primary author, a secondary author, or an instrumental author in the human author. All right. 107 of the Catechism tells us that the inspired books 
teach the truth. Now, I know that this is child's play for you, and I know that you know that. I don't believe there'd be anybody in here who wouldn't say amen to that. Sure, the inspired books teach the truth. All that the sacred writers affirm, now listen to this now. This is very important in the light of certain things that have gone on in the last several decades. In scholarship, I'll put it in quotation marks. The inspired books teach the truth. All that the sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit. The books of sacred scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. They teach firmly, faithfully, and without error. That is very important, and we'll see why as we go along. Paragraph 108 of the Catechism goes on to say that the Christian faith, now get that you listen to this one, this one will catch you by surprise. Some people would even fall out of their seat and think it's blasphemy or something. But I'm going to quote to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is a sure norm for teaching the faith in the Holy Father's own words. Still, paragraph 108, Catechism, still the Christian faith is not, quotation marks, a religion of the book. Close quotation. Now that is a rather startling statement. The Christian faith is not a religion of the book. Wow. What? How could, how could they say that? Well, here's why. Christianity is the religion of the word of God. A word which is not a written and mute word, but the word which is incarnate and living. If the scriptures are not to remain a dead letter... Christ, the eternal word of the living God, must, through the Holy Spirit, open our minds to, uh, to understand the scriptures. You can take even the Bible as holy, inspired, and beautiful it is, as it is. You can take that, and if you're not enlightened by the same spirit who is the author of that holy word, you can take that twist it, turn it, distort it, and destroy it in every way imaginable. And so what is an awfully important part of the method? It's called holiness. It's called holiness. It's called prayer. An awful lot of scholars have made an error in recent times. They've reduced scripture scholarship to a mere empirical science, and it is not. It is much more than that. It has dimensions of that, but it is not merely that. It is something much more. It is the living Word of God. The Holy Spirit Himself is the only authentic and authoritative interpreter of the Word of God, whether written or orally transmitted in the form of sacred tradition. Now, in the next hour, we're going to take a 15 minute break, but in the next hour, we're going to talk about the transmission of divine revelation. So we'll take a 15-minute break, and then we'll be back. We, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're going through the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, the Word of God. There are six chapters in that document. They correspond to the six talks that I'm going to be giving you. The first one that was in the last hour is divine revelation itself. 
Uh, this one right now, I'm going to be talking about the transmission of divine revelation. Tomorrow, we're going to have four lectures. The first one will be sacred scripture, its divine inspiration and its interpretation. And the next one will be on the Old Testament and the one following that, the New Testament. And the sixth and last lecture will be sacred scripture in the life of the church. Those are the six chapters of Dei Verbo. And they'll be the contents, uh, although it'll be a, a very brief synthesis when you only have an hour to do it. Each one of, uh, each one of those chapters could be a uh, university level course, actually. So we're, that when I said we're trying to do an impossible thing, uh, I meant it. But it's a beginning. You know, it's good that you act, even know that this exists. Uh, now, what I'd like you to do, uh, those of you who are especially serious, I know you're all serious because you've taken your time, which is very valuable, uh, to come here this evening and tomorrow. Uh, if you would like to follow up and uh, have a greater depth of understanding in this subject matter, uh, I would encourage you very strongly to read the document, read the text, De Verbo. Um, in the uh, documents of the Second Vatican Council, you'll find it in there, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. Read De Verbo. Uh, I, I used to have a um, professor in the seminary, and he had a very thick German accent. And he was always telling us, we, we read so much stuff. I mean, we read books after books commentators and so forth and so on and his favorite expression was return to the text <laughs> yeah read the text we're talking about Dei Verbum read it uh, I strongly uh, encourage you to read those sections of the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, that have to do with it with this partic particular topic and that's mainly paragraphs 50 through 141. It's not that much. You can read it in one sitting, really. Uh, paragraphs 50 through 141, which directly deal with divine revelation. And then there's an encyclical letter of Pope Leo XIII, which is very important if you want to uh, learn about Catholic methodology and how to read the Bible. Uh, Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, uh, on the study of sacred scripture, 18 November, 1893. You can get it from the Daughters of St. Paul. You can certainly get it um, from Easter's Catholic bookstore in Sacramento. They could order it for you if they don't have it on hand. And then uh, Pope Pius XII's encyclical on the pr promotion of biblical studies, the Vino Aflante Spiritu. Uh, that's a very short reading list. Now, most of you won't read it. I know you. Most of you want. You need to. Let me tell you something. If you don't do it, who do you think will? You know, you're going to wait for somebody else to get educated in these things? You sit back and say, well, it's not that important. You know, you wait for the priest to do it, the catechist. You do it. And if you don't do it, don't complain to me, the bishop, or anybody else that your children haven't learned your, their faith or your grandchildren. Do you know whose responsibility it is primarily to hand on the faith? Parents. Parents. Way more than the parish priest, the director of religious education. Oh, they help. They're there to assist you. But it is primarily the responsibility of parents to hand on what they themselves have received. All right. God reveals himself to us in the person of his only son, the word of God. If we were angels, and we're not, but if we were, we'd be able to see God as he is immediately. Now, the blessed in heaven can do that. Now, I'm, going to give, I'm giving you something to look forward to here. When you pass on, God willing, you're in a state of grace, 
everything goes well, you get on the elevator, you go up. <laughs> Something magnificent is going to happen. It's called beatific vision. And what that means is there is a mysterious work of grace that takes place, an elevation of the intellect which capacitates you to see God as he is. And what that means is without the mediation of created things, in the state that we're in now, the only way we can approach God really is through the mediation, the help of created things. Now, the word of God is God himself. But God has to transmit himself to us in a way that we can grasp. We can't see him immediately, face to face. And so he deals with us on our level. Okay? In his gracious goodness, the verbum tells us, paragraph 7, in his gracious goodness, God has seen to it that what he had revealed for the salvation of all nations would abide perpetually in its full integrity and be handed on to all generations. And what that means is, all right, 2,000 years ago, plus or minus, our father revealed himself to us in the person of his only son, his word, Jesus. Jesus assumed a human nature, the incarnation, and he became like one of us in everything except sin. He walked in Palestine. He talked with his disciples. What a magnificent thing it must have been to walk with Jesus, to talk with Jesus. Now, we do that in our walk of faith, but imagine if Jesus himself in person were there. Now that was a great thing. All right, so our Father did that for us. But then we know that Jesus suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day, and he ascended into heaven. Our Father wanted to perpetually preserve this revelation of his Son throughout the ages. That's the subject matter of this hour, the transmission of divine revelation, how the word of God is handed on through succeeding generations. Okay. Christ the Lord, in whom the full revelation of the supreme God is brought to completion, commissioned the apostles to preach to all men that gospel which is the source of all saving truth and moral teaching, and to impart to them heavenly gifts. All right. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Jesus teaches. He teaches his apostles and disciples mainly by his actions, also by his words. The closest collaborators of Jesus were the apostles. Of course, his mother, first and foremost, but the apostles, the 12 apostles. Now. I'm going to tell you a very, very consoling fact. I'm going to tell you about the best friends of Jesus, and it will make you feel much better. St. <laughs> Peter, always mentioned first, whenever the apostles are named, uh, St. Peter was an old fisherman. Uh, St. Peter was also a very coarse, rough man. How rough was he? Well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took out his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear. How rough is that? You know, it's one thing to shoot somebody or punch him in the nose. Another thing to take out a sword and cut off their ear. Peter was bad. <laughs> what about John and James? Now, I've just given you the three apostles that were closest to Jesus. The Mount of the Transfiguration, right? Who, who was up on the Mount of the Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John. Who was in the Garden of Gethsemane apart with Jesus? Peter, James, and John. They were special. Well, I already told you about Peter. What about James and John? You remember when they went through the Samaritan territory 
and they were tired and hungry and they needed hospitality. Now, Jews and Samaritans just didn't get along. They didn't like each other. And the Samaritans, the, the Samaritans would get lost. You know, no, we're not going to give you any hospitality. You remember what James and John did? They called in an airstrike. <laughs> oh, Lord, send down lightning and destroy them. That's, that's right. That's what they did. And Jesus called them Bonarges, sons of thunder. They had quite a mother, too. Remember her? She said, oh, Lord, arrange it that my sons, these two sons of mine, mine sit at your left and your right. Now, that's a Jewish mother. <laughs> All right. So the Lord gathered his apostles around him. They were the main collaborators with Christ. He taught them. And then he commissioned them to go out and teach what he had taught to them. What did Jesus teach? Himself. That's the truth. Jesus taught himself. He didn't teach something extrinsic or foreign to himself. Jesus the Lord taught himself. And then the apostles, sanctified by that word, who is Christ, and given a special charism. That's a unique type of a gift given by the Holy Spirit to an individual for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the church. The apostles were given a special charism to go out and teach Jesus to all the nation. This commission was faithfully fulfilled by the apostles who by their oral preaching, by example and by observances handed on what they had received from the lips of Christ, from living with him and from what he did or what they had learned from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And this is all in paragraph 7 of De Verbum. So the apostles learned from Jesus, and then they went out and preached. The apostles were preachers. The faith was spread primarily by preaching, and not just any preaching, inspired preaching, preaching that was graced, Preaching that was endowed with power. Now, I have always marveled that God called me to be a preacher. I, oh, a few years ago, was talking to my superior about it. Our ministry had grown, and we were literally reaching hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions, by now through television, radio, and so forth. And, and I was just marveling because, you know, you don't really know me. I know me. And I was marveling to my superior, why on earth God Almighty would choose a derelict like me to be a preacher? He never even batted an eye at He said, oh, that's easy. I said, well, why? He said, he couldn't find anybody worse. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? You think nobody on the face of the earth was better than Peter, James, John, Andrew, and all the rest of that crew? Oh, no. Part of the reason Jesus called them was probably because, indeed, they were common men, not highly educated, not well-born, not wealthy, so that when they did great things, nobody was confused about it. They knew very well that the power of God was at work. <laughs> I once reminded the people, I, during Lent, I was, uh, actually it was uh, Passion Sunday, and I was preaching on that, uh, the gospel uh, passage where Jesus rides into the holy city, seated on the uh, foal of a jackass, and I told the people uh, how the holy city, Jerusalem, is a type, a biblical type of the church, how Jesus rode into the church seated on the back of a jackass, and he continues to do so. <laughs> Lest we be proud about what we do. The reason God made me a preacher is, listen, you only have to 
listen to me for a couple hours here or there. I've got to listen to me day in and day out. <laughs> An elderly woman from this area, I might add, went, collared me one day and she said, now, Father, you know, you better be very good. And I said, why is that, my dear? She said, because if you're not, when you die, you will go to purgatory. And you know what happens there, don't you? And I said, well, no. She said, well, God will put you in a small room, and you will have to listen to your own tapes over and over <laughs> and over again. <laughs> All right, so Jesus taught his apostles, and then the apostles under the inspiration of a particular charism handed on faithfully what they themselves had received from the Lord. Now, in order to keep this gospel forever whole and alive within the church, the apostles left behind them bishops as their successors, handing over to them the authority to teach in their own place. Now, this is very, very important. This part of the whole little series we're doing here is of enormous importance. Pay attention, as Sister Mildred used to say to us. Sacred tradition, all right? I'm going to give you a word here. Now, if I said to you, sacred scripture or the Bible, nobody bad an eye and they say, yeah, everybody knows what that is, right? Here, here's the Bible. Everybody knows what a Bible is. This little course is how Catholics read the Bible. If I say to you, sacred tradition, a lot of blank stares come back at me. Did you know that sacred tradition has exactly the same weight in the Catholic Church as sacred scripture? Do you even know what sacred tradition is? Most people don't. That's why we're here. Now, even if you know, I'm here to confirm you in what you know. Someone once said to me, you know, Father, you preach to the choir. Don't you realize that? All these good people who come, you're preaching to the choir. And that's largely true. But it's the choir who goes out and forms the rest of the world. So you need to be confirmed in the faith. That's basically what the apostles did and the, what the bishops do. Confirm the brethren. All right. Jesus preached orally. He preached mainly by his example. They saw him. They saw how he acted. They saw his power. He also taught them with words. They received this. It stuck. And then they passed it on faithfully. This is an oral. This is an oral transmission. Remember here, we're talking about the transmission of divine revelation. So this revelation of our Father in the person of his Son, his only word, is transmitted first and foremost orally. Jesus taught orally. His apostles preached. That's an oral transmission of the faith. Some of what was preached was written down. We have two things here. Sacred scripture the oral proclamation of the word, the apostolic kerygma, it's called. Uh, that word, kerygma, charismatic, it comes from a Greek word. It has to do with an action of the Holy Spirit, a, a graced action. That, or, that apostolic kerygma, the preaching of the word of God, the preaching of Jesus. And there is a power that attaches to it through no merit whatsoever of my own. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I have that gift. Now, I didn't give it to myself, and I didn't discern it from myself. My superiors discerned it. Apostolic preaching. It's a specific kind of preaching. It doesn't have to do with being smart or clever. It doesn't have to do with being eloquent. It has to do with the power of God at work. What happens? Well. Nothing to do with me. You know, people say, oh, we're going to go hear Father Crappie. Poor you. You know? It's the Holy Spirit who works. You know, if a great musician were to pick up a broken violin and play a beautiful symphony, the violin would be quite stupid 
to exalt itself, if it even could do such a thing. It's the master who's behind it all. Apostolic preaching is the primary and first way that divine revelation was transmitted. Jesus preached. The apostles preached. Some of what was preached was written down. That's the New Testament. We already had the Old Testament. Jesus entered time and space. Through his actions and his words, he proclaimed the truth himself, Heavenly Father. Some of what the apostles heard and saw and experienced, some of that was written down by apostolic men, the evangelists and others. We have the four Gospels, we have the letters of St. Paul, St. Peter, St. John, and so forth. The New Testament. Okay. Some of that oral proclamation, I say some of that oral proclamation, was written down. How much of it wasn't written down? Read the last paragraph of the Gospel of John to get some intimation of how much wasn't written down. John said, I doubt that the world itself could contain all the books that would be necessary to record everything Jesus said and did. Some of the oral proclamation was written down. So, divine revelation, the eternal word, the word of God, Jesus. That is transmitted to us in an oral way and in a written way. That one word of God is transmitted orally, sacred tradition, and in a written form, sacred scripture. Now, whenever you have a word, whether written or spoken, we know from experience you need to have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of that word, whether written or spoken. If not, what's going to happen is you are going to have as many interpretations of that word as you are people interpreting. I mean, I, I know this from my own experience. I can go out and preach to a thousand people. One message comes out of my mouth, but you'd be amazed at how many different things are heard. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I have had people practically assault me, saying, you said this and this and that. I don't know what you were listening to, but you weren't listening to me. See, people receive things as they're disposed to receive things. Look at it this way. I've used this analogy many times. Some of you have heard it before. It's like, imagine a filter. You know, we have uh, filters in our car, an air filter, you know, fuel filter, and so forth. Everything we receive passes through a kind of filter. Now, that filter here is the sum total of our education, our cultural biases, our upbringing, our experience. The problem is very few people check their filter. <laughs> and the message, the word, gets tainted and distorted, and it comes through different ways to different people. So wherever you have a word, whether that word is written or orally transmitted, you've got to have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of that word. Now, God in his great wisdom, he knows human nature. God is the author and architect of human nature. He knows how it works. And so he knows what we need. And sure enough, he gave us exactly what we need. He gave us the apostles, and then the apostles appointed bishops to succeed them. Okay. Apostolic succession. You've heard that term, perhaps. Apostolic succession. The bishops in union with the bishop of Rome. Now, what is that called? That's called the magisterium of the church, the teaching office. That's, that word magisterium means teaching office, the teaching office of the church. So, the apostolic preaching, was, which is expressed in a special way in the inspired books, was to be preserved by an unending succession of preachers until the end of time. 
Therefore, the apostles, handing on what they themselves had received, warned the faithful. The apostles warned the faithful to hold fast to the traditions which they have learned either by word of mouth or by letter. Now, that is a quote from St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 15. Hold fast to what you've received, either by word of mouth, preaching, or by letter, in writing, scripture. All right? So God transmits himself to us in the person of his word, and that word comes to us in a preached form, orally, and in a written form, the Bible. Now, the plot thickens how Catholics read the Bible. Now, I respect, I really do, I respect anybody and everybody's religion. I really do. Whether you're a Christian of whatever denomination, Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, I respect everyone's religion, and I respect their right to practice their faith the way they feel moved to. I'm not a syncretist, however. That's a particular heresy, which imagines that all religions are the same. They're not. You are in the right place. <laughs> all right, but please don't, you know, every, I, one of the, I, I guess you could call it occupational hazards of doing what I do, is that people misunderstand you, people misquote you, people say all kinds of, oh, Father Croppy said this, and he said that, and he said the other thing. Well, I might have said this, or that, or the other thing, but some of it I probably never said. And one thing I've never said is anything to knock anybody's faith. I totally respect all human beings and what every person believes. I respect their right, anybody's right, uh, to practice their own religion. However, <laughs> if you'd like to know what we Catholics do, that's what we're here for. Sacred tradition, the oral transmission of revelation given to us by the preaching of Christ, received by the apostles, handed on faithfully. The bishops, their successors, handed it on under the charism and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The oral transmission of the word of God. The Bible, the written transmission of the word of God. The magisterium, the authentic and authoritative interpreter of the one only word of God, whether written or orally transmitted. And so, we've got three essential things to deal with in divine revelation. Without these three things in place, you can't read the Bible as Catholics read the Bible. Now, I know I'm preaching primarily to Catholics here, and that's who I preach to. Anyone else is welcome to listen. But I'm preaching to Catholics. I teach Catholics. Uh, I am not, you know, the older I get, the less inclined I am to argue with anybody. I don't argue with anybody. It's my way or the highway. I, I don't debate. You know, every now and then someone says, would you go on television? But I don't debate. There's a place for debate, by the way. It's a good thing. You know, apologetics, absolutely, it's a good thing. Some people are called that. I'm not called to that. Do you know, the, you know, the apostles now and then, they debated now and then, but they preached from a position of authority. Why do you receive it? Because it sounds good? Because of... Worldly wise argumentation, that no way. You receive it because God has revealed it. Now, there's one thing I have always done, and one thing I'm doing now, and one thing I'll do to the day I die, and that's handed on faithfully as we have received it. Not just interjecting my mere personal opinions. Not giving you something watered down, diminished, or distorted. Giving you what we have received. And we received it from Christ. 
who gave it to the apostles, who handed it on to their successor, the, the bishop. That is what we're dealing with. The word of God, this method, this method of how Catholics read the Bible is of enormous importance. Now, I've traveled all over the United States. At the end of this year, I will have preached in 49 of the 50 states. By next year, it will probably be 50 of 50. I've preached in several foreign countries. I have seen a few things in that period of time. And one of the most distressing things I've seen is that Catholics are grossly ignorant of their faith. Period. And you know what happens when Catholics are ignorant of their faith? People leave the faith. That's what happens. When I was down in Central America a few years ago preaching, the bishops had a synod, and I happened to be there, and they invited me for some of the session, and they were lamenting bitterly that they had lost five million out of their churches in the previous three years alone. Five million out of a few small countries. Everybody was Catholic in Mexico, Central and South America for years. Everybody. For every one Catholic church being built in Central America, 1,500 assemblies of God were being built. Why? Catholics were leaving in droves. Why? In the first place, because they didn't know what they had. And so, you know, easy to leave when you don't know what you have. But if you know what you have, where are you going? Oh, we, oh they got better fellowship over there. <laughs> you going to trade in better fellowship for Jesus in the Eucharist, for the Blessed Mother, for a sure knowledge of the faith that comes to us through that ap apostolic Succession, the transmission of divine revelation, that's silly. But I understand how it can happen. We have done a poor job in many cases of teaching the faith. That, I mean, we priests, the bishops, often we've done a poor job. That's why the Holy Father, for many reasons, he's been repenting. He's been leading the church in repentance because we haven't been that great in doing this or that or the other. And he's very humble. Man, he'll be canonized. He'll be a canonized saint when the smoke clears, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> and not only that, he will probably be, I think, the third pope in history to receive the title, the Great. He'll be John Paul the Great. Now, that be, he ordained me a priest. <laughs> not that that has anything to do with it. I like him, you know. But if I were Pope, I probably wouldn't do a lot of things the way he does. Happily, I'll never be Pope. I can barely be a priest. The magisterium of the church. Do you know where the Bible came from? You know, th th this is a very fundamental question. Most people don't think. And that's why we have all the ridiculous propositions that are floating around out there in outer space. You th the, this Bible didn't fall out of the heavens. Who decided what goes in this Bible? The magisterium of the church, that's who decided. The canon of scripture was determined by the church. And remember, there was only one church for the first many centuries of history. Okay? Now, God is one. I started to tell you this before. One God, three divine persons. Fundamental theology, you all know that. God, the one God who is three defined persons, reveals himself to us. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Now I have just given you a very important, essential, fundamental truth. Divine revelation, the revelation of the one God to us in his only word. That revelation comes to us in three interconnected, compenetrated ways. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. That means no one of which can be without the other two. No tradition and magisterium, no Bible. So when we're talking about how Catholics read the Bible, Catholics better know there's such a thing as tradition and magisterial teaching. 
If your concept of God is merely Holy Spirit, is your concept of God correct? Nope. No, God, we know it's one God, but three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If your concept of divine revelation is merely the Bible, sola scriptura, then your concept of revelation is erroneous. The one God revealed himself to us in the person of his word, his only word, and that word, that one only word, is transmitted to us in a Trinitarian way. How else would God do it? Tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Now I'm going to give you a very easy theology lesson here. God. One God. All right. Three divine persons. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two persons must be. In virtue of what we call the mystery of unity or circumincession, the divine perichoresis. I'm giving you a bunch of theology words here. You don't have to remember. But let me say this again. The concept is important, and you can get it, and it's fundamental. And if you interiorize this, you will know more than an awful lot of theologians today. One God, three divine persons. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two persons must be in virtue of the inviolable mystery of unity. All right. Wherever scripture is, their tradition and magisterial teaching must be. Wherever magisterial teaching is, their scripture and tradition must be. Wherever tradition is, their scripture and magisterial teaching must be. Do you understand that? Can you grasp or begin to grasp the enormous significance and, and the consequences of this? This, this, is, this is a, it's a revelation that is absolutely earth-shaking once you get it. You can, you can understand so many things once you get this principle. So many people seek to read the Bible in a vacuum. It wasn't written in a vacuum. This isn't even the Bible unless tradition and magisterial teaching are taken into account. What it is, it is something else. It's something else. But it's not the authentic Word of God. There are some principles, some very, very important principles in reading the Bible. You've got to follow these principles. They're essential. Now, as I said before, the full canon of Scripture was determined by the church, by the magisterium of the church. Now, the magisterium, once again, that's the pope. He's the successor of St. Peter, the head of the apostolic band, and the bishops in union with him. That's the magisterium of the church, the Holy Father and the bishops united to him. I might add, in case some confusion arises in this area. I might add that that magisterium, the authentic magisterium of the church, is the Holy Father, the Pope, and the bishops in union with him teaching the same thing in its essence taught by Jesus Christ, the apostles and their successors throughout the ages, everywhere and always. That's a test. If you understand that principle, you can defuse a lot of silly arguments. All right? For instance, can any essentially new teaching come out of the atmosphere? No, no way. No, the, our faith has been received. It's a pearl of great price. It has been received. Well, how, how did we receive it? Well, God gave it to us in the person of his son. That revelation was transmitted to us in a Trinitarian way. Sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Words are very, very important. The English translation of that says no one of which can stand without the other two. 
Well, that's okay. But when I read it in Spanish, in French, in Latin, the word that jumped out at you was subsist. That, now, that's a, the, that's a philosophy word, okay, subsistence. Subsist. That's a word from metaphysics. And, and basically what it means, it just, it can't exist. In other words, no one of which. The Bible can't exist without sacred tradition and magisterial teaching. This is a living word. The word of God is a living word. It is not a mute letter. It is not a dead letter. It is living. It is Trinitarian. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with God. What has been revealed? This is so simple, it's ridiculous, but it goes over the heads of the learned and the clever. And you really got to be a little one to get this. Divine revelation. What's been revealed to us? God has been revealed to us. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has been revealed to us. And the way he revealed himself to us was in the person of his Son, and that revelation is transmitted in the form of tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching. And you've got to know up one side and down the other what those things mean and how they are interrelated, interdependent, and I like the word, nobody, people used to make fun of me. There are people all over the country who've listened to my stuff and they memorize it. I had a kid eight years old come up and give one of my sermons to me one day. <laughs> With all the, the correct inflections of voice, he sounded just like me, poor thing. <laughs> There's a compenetration between, among tradition, scripture, and magisterial teaching. Sacred scripture is the word of God in, in as much as it is consigned to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, while sacred tradition takes the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles and hands it on to their successors in all its purity. So that led by the light of the spirit of truth, they may, in proclaiming it, preserve the word of God faithfully, explain it, and make it more widely known. Consequently, now listen to this. Consequently, it is not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. All right, I'm going to say that again, just to make sure it sinks in. You know, they say that you have to hear something 16 times before the human mind grasps it once and for all. I promise I won't do it 16 times, but I'll do it once more. Consequently, it is not from sacred scripture alone that the church draws her certainty about everything that has been revealed. Now, have you ever gotten into a, for lack of a harsher word, discussion with some of the brethren concerning something and they say, well, show it to me in the Bible. Let me count the ways and the times. Show it to me in the Bible. It may be in the Bible. A lot of times it is in the Bible. Things like purgatory, oh, it's right in there. You know, if you've got eyes to see, it's in there. The Eucharist, the institution of the Eucharist. Is that biblical? You bet. Right in there. Gospel of John, chapter 6, how about for a good start? There are other places too. However, there are also things which don't leap out from the page of sacred scripture that are doctrinal things, absolute doctrinal certainties. Well, the church doesn't draw all her certainty from scripture alone. Remember how it came down to us. Jesus preached. That's the oral transmission. He imparted himself. I, I like to use that word. It's a better word than teach. Teach is a good word. But you know the faith is more imparted than taught. Teaching has the normal connotation of you learn something and you hand it on. 
you know, like a school teacher might do. That's a good thing. That's a very noble thing. Imparting the faith is something that is deeper. It involves an intimacy. Uh, the first time I met Mother Teresa of Calcutta, I came in contact with Jesus in a very beautiful and intimate way. She imparted, she radiated Christ to me. Um, a great man from the British media, Malcolm Muggeridge, had studied the faith for many years. He was a very brilliant man. He knew all the arguments, but he couldn't come to conversion and enter the Catholic Church. He met Mother Teresa one day, and boom, that was it. He entered the church. That's imparting the faith. Okay? So the teaching it is one thing. That involves a kind of an extra thing, something extrinsic to yourself. But, you know, I'll probably never teach a course in the seminary because I'm not a, a seminary professor. But every once in a while they ask me, I'll preach at a seminary or give a retreat. And the men always ask me about preaching. How, well, how can I be a good preacher? You know, they think there's a, uh, uh, I don't know, a system to it or method. And I say, I'll tell you what the method is. Love Jesus. Come into great intimacy. And then how could you not speak with fire about the one you love? Uh, th that's it. I mean, right there is to become one with the one who you preach. Become one with the word of God and you will radiate the word of God to your family, to, you, to your workplace, to everybody. All right. So we've got tradition, scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Now I'm going to remind you of a passage from the Gospel of Matthew. It's very important. Jesus and his disciples were passing through the region of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus stopped them. And he said, who do the people say the Son of Man is? The first Gallup poll. <laughs> What's the general population have to say about it? You know, who do the people say I am? Well, some said John the Baptist. Some said Elijah. Some said Jeremiah. Some said one of the other prophets. No, when you take a public opinion poll. What do you get? Well, you get personal opinions. Mere personal opinions. Conflicting and contradictory personal opinions. And they can't all be right. So that's what Jesus got. And then he turned to his closest collaborators. He said, but, but who do you say that I am? Talking to the apostle. Who do you say that I am? I can well imagine an eerie silence for a moment. Then one voice rang out with all the authenticity and authority of truth. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. Ah, Simon, son of John. No mere man has revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, and I, for my part, stop right there. I, who's the I? I, for my part, this is a divine I speaking. This is a divine subject of action speaking. I'm going to give you a little example of how failure in method can lead to less than the desired result. There have been scholars in recent times who have arrived at the conclusion that Jesus never intended to found a church. Oh, yeah. Not only that, I, I'll, I'll tell you a real one. Here's a, here's a personal story. From, I had great teachers all through the seminary, university. I was very fortunate. But every once in a while, even in good places, some bozo sneaks through. <laughs> and this guy... One day, we knew where he was coming from, but God help us, and, and he had a degree from, of all places, Berkeley. Need I say more? 
And the degree was, he went through in the 70s. <laughs> we already had a cue about where he was coming from, but one day he says, he comes in the classroom, he says, well, today I'm going to tell you about the manna in the desert. And we all kind of looked at each other and we said, this will be good. <laughs> As the result of advanced scripture scholarship and the findings of archaeology, fasten your seatbelt, <laughs> we have now been able to conclude what it was that the manna in the desert was. We now know, as the result of scholarship, that the manna in the desert was ant dung. I swear that's what he said. <laughs> ant dung. We all looked at each other. And I wanted, I was coming out of my seat like an MX missile. Because I wanted to ask this biblical scholar what that did for the biblical type of the Eucharist. Now I know who the scholar was who came to that conclusion and his name is Satan. That's right. Now, there was a failure in method that led to that conclusion. Oh, many of these scholars just completely ignore the principles the church herself has laid down for engaging in this method. There's a specific method for proceeding in Catholic theology and how Catholics read the Bible. Now, Jesus, a divine person, declares, I declare, how much clearer can it be? I declare, now the subject of action is divine. Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. He's declaring, God's declaring. You are rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church. He changes Simon's name to rock, Peter. Now, there are a lot of explanations of this, and some of the commentaries talk about a big rock and a little rock. Well, listen. The only rock is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone upon which the church is built, upon which our faith is built. Jesus is the rock to be sure. But Jesus himself does something mysterious here. He declares Simon to be rock. Now a name in antiquity meant much more than it does today. A name in antiquity made present, it was, as they say in philosophy, a positive hypostasis that made present the power behind it. A perfect example of it is the name Jesus. God saves. The name and the reality of the being attached to the name are one. God saves. That's Jesus. Peter, rock. What happened? Now, Jesus is the rock. Jesus knew scripture. He was a rabbi. You take a concordance of the Bible, you look through it on the word rock, and you see it many, many times. Most of the time, it's used in the ordinary sense of the term. The rocks rolled down the hillside. They picked up rocks to stone the man. Every once in a while, however, it is capitalized. You are the rock of my salvation. Capital R. He is the rock upon which our faith is built. Capital R. It refers to God. Now, what is Jesus doing? Changing Simon's name to capital R. Simon is not God. We know that. Far from it. He is a weak, sinful man. But Jesus is saying, Simon, I will graft you into myself. A mystical marriage will take place. The two shall become one. And when you speak in my name, it will be me speaking through you in faith and morals. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me and him who sent me. The union of Christ, the head of his church, and his mystical body, Peter, is the visible head of the church, but the head of the church is Christ. It is Peter, the principle of unity, that we must look to for this teaching. The Pope and the bishops united to him. Now, I'm going to 
close this hour with a very powerful and very important passage, and it will illustrate to you why good translation is very, very important. Do you remember when Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. Now, I read that. You've all heard it before many times. I'm going to read it to you again as it is. And we'll see how many of you have really read it before. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you. You is used twice there, right? Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you. The original Greek, the Koine Greek, which is translated properly into Latin, is vos, plural. Satan has demanded to sift or to, to have you all. This is the translation. Satan has demanded to have you all, plural, that he might sift you all, plural. But I have prayed for thee, te in Latin, singular. Satan has demanded to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you personally, Peter. And you better be included for the, in the prayer for Peter. For it is in Peter that unity subsists. Now what happens when you're separated from Peter? Satan sifts us as wheat. And so Martin Luther leaves, and Calvin leaves, and Zwingli leaves, and now we have over 60,000 Christian groups teaching this, that, or the other thing, and I respect them all, but God wills one flock and one shepherd. That is the translation. Satan has demanded you, all of you, that he might sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter, you personally, and anyone in you will be preserved in unity. How Catholics read the Bible. See you tomorrow.